Things not working. Okay, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> all right, good morning again. It's good to see you all in the house of the Lord this morning. Um, I, I do thank you very much for coming out. Um, you know, um, I, I know I've shared many times with you, and um, and I do take it maybe too personal at times uh, whenever I see people that no longer want to call the church church anymore, especially this church anymore. It, it does it does bother me. It, it bothers me a great deal, and um, and I'm being truthful uh, in that card, and I try and be truthful with you. I try to express to you that there there is not there is not a gift in this world that is more important than having you here in this church, and um, that that is the greatest gift uh, besides the salvation I have through through Jesus Christ. But uh, you guys being here so faithfully every Sunday, uh, I. I can't begin to say enough thanks for that. So um, we continue on with, we started a, a new series last Sunday, and we, we asked the question last Sunday, which is the question that we've all asked, and that is, you know, why in the world am I here? Why, why are we here? Why in the world would, would God take, a, take some dirt out of the ground and, and make human life, make this life, make your life? Why would the world ever do that? So what you know? Obviously, there's got to be something that God has a purpose for. There's something. There's some reason. In this case, there are several reasons of why we're here. Uh, and the the first thing that we we started talking on is in the book of Colossians, chapter one, uh, verse sixteen, which which becomes one of our foundational verses for this series. And in that verse, Paul says that we that everything is created by Him for Him. And so what, what Paul was telling us is that, that God created us for himself. Uh, God created us for himself. That's purpose number one. We are created for God. God created us for himself. Meaning that, that God, first of all, God wants us to have a relationship. He, he wants a relationship with us, and he wants us to have a relationship with him. That's, that's part of being created by him or, and being created for him. That, that having that, that intimacy, having that relationship with God, the relationship uh, God wants to have with you, and, and God also wants us to have with him. The, the other thing, another reason that God created us is he created us for himself to bring him worship. God wants to be worshipped. Um, the Bible tells us that God's a jealous God. And jealousy in that context, we, we think of jealousy as being a very evil word, a very negative word. We really shouldn't be jealous. But, but God is a jealous God because God wants our worship. God deserves our worship. God deserves our praise. God deserves our our. Um, our acclamation of him, our extolling of him, lifting them up, uh, having our lives be about him. And that's, that is worship. Um, he also created us, as Paul says in that Romans chapter 14 we saw last Sunday, God also created us that we are not to live each day for ourselves. Um, <laughs> We're not, we're not to be selfish of our time. Uh, of take, the Bible says that we are to make the most of every opportunity God gives to us. And so making the most of every opportunity means that we are not living uh, each and every day for our own doing, for our own purposes. We're living each day for God. That's another reason why God created us. God created us for himself. He wants a relationship with us. He wants us to bring him worship, to bring him praise. He wants us to live each and every day for him. He, he, he is the reason why we live. Uh, and then Paul also said that, um, that we belong to him. We, we, we are the property of God. And we saw last Sunday in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, uh, Paul, tell, Paul goes a little bit deeper into what that means to be a property of God. To mean, what it means to be, to be uh, ownership or to be owned by God, to be, to be that, that property of, of God. And so the first thing Paul said is that we're redeemed. That, that's why we belong to God. We belong to God because God has redeemed us. He's redeemed us through the blood of Jesus Christ. He, he paid that price. I asked, you last, I asked you last Sunday, what does that word redeem mean? It means to make restitution. And that word restitution means to make payment or, or to, to, make, to make it right. Uh, a debt that we pay or a debt that we owe, I should say. And, and Jesus, God sent Jesus to pay that debt. And so we are redeemed. We are, uh, God has paid that restitution through the blood of Jesus. And he also tells us that we're the property of God because God's spirit lives in us. 
God's Spirit lives in us because we have chosen the way of life. We have chosen the way of eternity, which is offered, which is offered through Jesus Christ alone. And then, uh, again, Paul says, because the Spirit lives in us, again, he says, because you're the property of God, because God has redeemed you, because God's Spirit lives in you, and so therefore we are to live our lives for God. And then um, we finished it up and said, well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says, you know, because of what Jesus has done, uh, Jesus, God gave us Jesus, and because of what Jesus has done, Jesus gave himself, and so therefore we are to give our lives to God. We are to live our lives for God. And so last Sunday our lesson was about Solomon. Solomon went on this, on this journey, this quest, trying to find the meaning of life. I know every one of us has tried to seek the meaning of life, tried to seek what the value of life is. Again, going back to our very first question, why in the world am I here? Why, why did God put me here? Why, there, there is a purpose here. There's a purpose for me being here. There's a purpose for you being here. Why in the world are we here? And so we go on, we go on quests too, trying to find the very same answer. Why am I here? What is my purpose in life? What, why, why, why did God give me two feet and two arms and a belly, a body and a head and a brain and so forth and so on? Well, Solomon went on that very same journey, and he was looking for things that he felt that would bring value to his life, that would bring meaning to his life. He, he searched for it in worldly <laughs> pleasures. He searched for it in all kinds of personal achievements. He searched for it in his own personal property. He had, oh my, he had, he had, he had an enormous amount of personal property. He had, he had so much gold and so much silver and, and, all, and all the other precious uh, treasures that he had received from all the other kings. All the other queens from the other nations. So he had he had searched for it in, in personal wealth. He searched for it in the number of women that he had, uh, not only his wives but also his girlfriends. And so he, he thought that would that was the meaning of life. That was what brought value to life was all of, was uh, was was the women and the children he had. And then he thought, well, maybe it's the hard work. Maybe it's all that work that I have that I have done. And and he works hard and he puts a lot of hours in. And, and, and obviously, all of those things, it, it, he finally came out and said, you know, those things uh, left him empty-handed. Those things, uh, th they did not fill that, that, they did not answer that question of, you know, what does bring meaning to life? What, what brings value to life? And he tells us that, that, that those pursuits were, were meaningless pursuits. He calls it chasing after the wind. It, 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 again, it didn't, it, didn't get, it didn't get the answer he was looking for. It didn't bring him to that place in his life where he felt, yeah, that was really what life is all about. That's why I'm here. That's why God put me on this earth. And then so, so, so Solomon sought all of those things. He sought that personal gain, that personal achievement, that personal, um, the, all those children and women he had and, and all of his achievements. And, and all that uh, worldly wealth and uh, worldly possessions. And he came back and said those, those things were not it. And, and a man, this man was extremely rich and exp extremely powerful. He was the second wisest man uh, behind Jesus, of course. And so he would have, he would have had great amounts of, of achievements and personal gain. But in the end, it left him and said, you know, those things were not what was adding value. And finally, uh, Solomon comes to the end and says, you know, I know, I know exactly what brings value to life. And he tells us that we are to fear God and obey God. In other words, uh, what he's saying, what is the meaning of life? What is the value of life? And he talks about the fear of God and the obedience of God. He's talking about one thing. When we live our lives for God. When we are, when we are, when we are in awe or in worship, that word fear means to be in awe, means to be in worship of God. We are living a life for God. We are living our lives for God when we are, in, when we are in, uh, in, involved in worship. Uh, and that worship can be a lot of things. Uh, we are also uh, in, in living our lives for God when we're living our lives in obedience to God. So when, when Solomon says, you know, it, it is a duty of man, it is the duty of man to fear God and obey God. He is talking about it's the duty of man, duty of mankind to live our lives for the Lord, to give our lives to God, to live each and every day for God. And so what we're, our, our series is called right here. It says that we're talking about a life well lived is a life that is lived for Jesus. That's what we're talking about in this series. We're talking about, again, we're, talk, we're asking the question, why are we here? Well, first and foremost, we are here to live our lives for God. We are here to live each and every day for the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Today, we're going to go to the second verse, the, the second passage of Scripture that is our hallmark passage 
for this series, and we're gonna we're going to look at Galatians chapter two verse twenty today, and we're really gonna we're really gonna dissect this verse today because there is a there's a lot of stuff in here where Paul is showing us what it means to live a well life and to live that life for Jesus. That's what we're gonna look at today because um, there's a lot of good there's a lot of good things in here that that Paul was sharing with us on what it means to live a well life to to live that life. Jesus. All right. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, as I've said. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to read that one more time. Because again, we're going we're gonna to really digest this verse today. We're going to really dissect this verse today. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All right. So the first thing Paul introduces us or tells us about this this. This life well lived, this life that we are to live for the Lord, to live for Jesus. He says there's a reason why we should do that. There, there's a reason why every one of us should get up every morning and say, today I want to live my life for the Lord. Today I want to live my life for Christ. Today I want to I want to make this day the Lord's day in my life. And the reason being is because our sinful self has died. Our, our, our sin nature, our, sins, our sinful self died when Jesus died. That's what Paul said. Paul says that it is no longer I who live, it is Jesus that lives in me. Obviously, Paul, is, he is still Paul in the flesh. He is still, he is still people know him as Paul, but there's been a change in Paul's life. He, he is no longer living as Paul once lived. Now, his sinful self, my sinful self, your sinful self died. There, there is no, there is no, uh, there is no old Trav anymore. That old Trav died. Now the old Trav still has his ugly face once in a while, but it, but it's supposed to be dead because my old self, your old self, died when Jesus died. <laughs> so that's that's that is the that is reason number one. We're going to digest that a little bit further this morning. That's reason number one why we should be getting up every morning and saying, "I want to live a life well lived today, and I want to live it for Jesus." Today. All right. The second thing that, that Paul tells us is that because of because of what Christ has done, because of because of, of that of that enormous enormous amount of, of of death that he that he incurred for us, that should and because of what took place on Calvary for us, that should cause us now to be rethinking about our lives, rethinking about well, hmm, these are these are these are the old things I used to do. And these are, the, these are the new things that Jesus wants me to do. And so therefore, I should have a change in direction, a change in heart. A heart that says, I don't want to live for myself anymore. I don't want to live for my purposes. I don't want to live to please me. I want to live to please God. I want to live my life for God's purposes. I want God to get the praise. I want God to get the attention. I want God to, to get the center where he needs to be. And so Paul is saying that it is no longer I that live, but it is Jesus or Christ that lives in me. And he says, I no longer, now that the life that I live, I live in the flesh. He says, I live in faith in Jesus Christ. And so again, he's talking about this, this, this transaction that Christ has made. This transaction has been so impactful to him, so meaningful to him, that it has caused a change in his life. A, a, a drastic change in his life, a significant change in his life, where he's now saying, listen... I know that myself has died, and so therefore, because Jesus gave himself for me, I want to give myself to him. I want to live for his purposes. I, want to, I don't want to live for my purposes. I want to live for God's purposes, what he wants in my life, what he wants, me to, what he wants my life to be, where he wants me to go, what he wants me to say, so forth and so on. Now, the last thing he says, he says that we live our lives with faith. Now, those are the three things we're going to digest this morning, dissect this morning a little bit deeper. Uh, again, talking about our, our sinful self has died when Jesus died. That old, that old me, that old you that's gone, uh, it's, it's gone because of what Jesus did on the cross, the transaction. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us, it, it should have such an effect upon us. 
It should have such a, 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 an effect upon us that we're really thinking about our lives and thinking, you know, this is, this, is, this is not why I should be living my life. This is not who I should be living my life for. Going back to what Solomon said, Solomon said, listen, I'm trying to find what's value here, I'm trying to find why on the earth God put me here. Well, finally he comes to his senses and says, you know, I know what God, why God put me here. My, God put me here to fear him and obey him, to live my life for him. And so the, that transaction that, that Jesus has done on the cross for us should, should, have a, should have an effect upon us where we're thinking about our, our daily lives. Where we get up every morning and we say, listen, today is not Travis's day. Today is Jesus' day. And I get up tomorrow morning, you get up tomorrow morning and say, today is not this person's day, your person's day. This is Jesus' day. We live, we don't be, we have a, we have a change, uh, we have a change in purpose in our lives. All right. Romans chapter 6 verse 4 says, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. So now there's some, there's some things that, that Paul is telling us that God has done through the cross, through Jesus Christ. <laughs> First of all, God has given us many, many, many mulligans. The word I use the word do-over or the phrase do-over. We can think of it being a mulligan. Uh, I think about I think about when I when I was uh, paying, when I was wor working on the lesson a little bit this morning. I, the first thing I thought about was the was the prodigal son or the prodigal daughter in the in the lady's case. How many of us have played that prodigal son or that prodigal daughter? Every one of us. How many times have we played that prodigal son or that prodigal daughter? Many times. And so every time I walk away from God, the Father is there waiting for me to return. Every time you walk away from God, the Father is there waiting for you. He gives us do-over mulligan after mulligan after mulligan after mulligan after mulligan. He has given us multiple mulligans. He also tells us that, uh, Paul tells us that he has given us spiritual freedom. He, we, we have been set free from that slave, that life of, that life of sin, that, that, that enslavement of sin. We've been set free from that. He also tells us that God has given us eternal life. And then he also tells us that he has given us a new life. Going back to what Paul said. Paul said, that old self, that old me, that old you has died when Jesus died. And now he has given us a new self, a new, a new person inside of us. Now, because, because we, have, we have this new image, this new, this new personification, he says that we are to live our lives, our new life, with, uh, with faith in Jesus Christ. That our, our living out of this new life requires faith. I can't live out, you cannot live out our new lives without the most essential piece, the most essential ingredient, which is faith. Every one of us needs faith to live out our new life. Now, in Philippians chapter 3, Paul says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And being found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him and the power of resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. All right, so now Paul is going, one, I want to go one step further where Paul's going with this. Paul says, he's talking about this living his life, living our lives for Jesus. He says, first of all, he says, nothing else like it. There is nothing in this world of more value than living your life for Jesus. There is nothing more in this, there is nothing in this world that can give you, that will add any more greater value than living your life for Jesus. That's what he said. He said, he said, I want to know God. I want to know Christ. That's all he wants to know. And so he's, he's saying that there's nothing, there is nothing more valuable. He also tells us that because of this value of knowing Christ, because of this value of living for the Lord, because there's no greater value than living each day, getting up every morning and saying, today is Jesus' day. I'm going to live for him. 
Now, you're sure we're all going we're all gonna, we're human beings, we're going to fall short of that, but, what, but, we, but we still get with that purpose in mind to live our lives for Jesus. And so he tells us that because of that value, he says that even sufferings and hardships cannot derail us. He talks about everything he's lost. He says, everything that I've lost because of knowing I want to know Christ, because I want to live my life for Christ, everything that I've lost, he says, they're, they're, they're rubbish. He says, they're, they're not going to cause me to rethink how important it is for me to live my life for Christ. It's not going to cause me to, it's not going to cause me to second guess what I'm doing and what God's doing in my life. I'm not going to second guess. It. I'm not going to allow those sufferings and hardships to derail what's important to me. What's important to me is to know God. What's important to me is to, know, is to live my life, the remaining days of my life, for the Lord. Now, he also says that, that with our faith, uh, we live out our faith. He says that we anticipate the reward that comes in the end of the journey because of our faith. And that reward, again, goes back to why... It goes back to why, why, why uh, we would even want to live our lives for Jesus, because there's a great reward for us. There's, there's a reward that surpasses all, uh, all the amount of money, all the amount of gold, all the amount of gems there are in this world. Nothing will be like it. Now, he also tells us that when we live our lives here on this earth for the Lord, it will continue when we get to heaven. Every day, we will get up and we will live for, for the purpose of the Lord each day in heaven. Every day, we will, we will have the same purpose. Every one of us will share the same purpose every day as we're going to live our lives for the Lord. We, we make our decision today to live our lives, whatever remains on this earth, to live for him today. Because, again, there's nothing more greater. There's nothing more on this earth more of value. Solomon tried to find. He couldn't find it. And so there's nothing in this world that can ever outlast or out, 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 uh, out reward you for living your life for Christ. And in the end, you're still going to live your life for Christ. When you get to heaven, you're still going to do it every day. Now, that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about living our lives for Jesus because that's what we're going to talk about in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. We're going to digest that. So again, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God who, gave, who loved me and gave himself for me. So the first thing I want us to, I want us to focus on is... What Paul says, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. So when, when Jesus died, he has, he has eradicated the sin from our lives. What I mean by that is, it, mean, it means that our sin has been erased. There is no, there is no sin. When, uh, 1 John chapter 2, I think, says that, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. So when we, when, as we confess our sins, as we, as, we, as we open up our sins to God and say, God, I failed. I, I fell short here. I did this. I said that. I should have done this. I should have done that. Whatever it is, when we confess those things, God has already eradicated them. God has already erased them through the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus is not going to go to the cross again and die a second time for our sin. There is no reason for Jesus to go back to the cross again and die for our sin a second time. Because that sacrifice was the one sacrifice that eradicated and erased all human sin. Now, the other thing, the other thing that Paul says, he says that, um, again, going back to what I said earlier, our sinful self died when Jesus died. So what I want to say is in Colossians chapter 3 where Paul says, For you have died and your life is hidden in Christ and God. Now, what is, what is, uh, what is what's God trying to tell us here with this? He's trying to tell us that, that because of what Jesus has done, because of, of my sinful self dying when Jesus died, and because of Jesus eradicating the sin in my life, erasing all that sin in my life, what happened was God then clothed me with his righteousness, with Jesus' righteousness. So that whenever I do sin, God doesn't see my sinfulness. What does God see? He tells us, he says that he has clothed us in God's righteousness or in Jesus' righteousness. So when he, see, when he sees me, when he sees my heart, he doesn't see the sinful trail because that old sinful trail is dead. Remember? When he sees, he sees the righteousness of God. He sees Jesus' righteousness inside of me. He sees Jesus inside of me. 
What did, what did, we, what did we learn last Sunday from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6? He said that, that we are the property of God because God has put his spirit in us. So he sees Jesus in us. All right. Now, the next thing I want us to look at is what Paul says. And he says, I no longer live. I no longer live, but it is Jesus that lives in me. <clears throat> and so, when we died, the old us died. Our old us is our old way of living. All of those do's and don'ts. Uh, all of those, I should say, more focused on don'ts. All of those don'ts. That's our old self. Our old self, our old way of living that's died with Christ. Now, Jesus lives inside of you. Jesus lives inside of me. Now, what does God want to do? God wants to take that Jesus inside of us, and he wants to have, it, have Jesus live outside of us as well. He doesn't want us to hold on to Jesus on the inside. He wants us to, to let Jesus live on the outside of us as well as he's living on the inside of us. And so when Paul says that it is nobody, he says that, yeah, I'm still living, I'm still Paul, but it's not me that live. It's Christ that lives in me. And so what he's saying, he's saying that, that God, through, through Jesus Christ, is living inside of me, but also God is living outside of me. People see Jesus in me. People know that Jesus lives in me. People sense and, and, and understands that I am filled with Jesus. And so there's one, there's a one, goes back to our very, very beginning when we said that we no longer live for our purposes. We live for Jesus' purposes. It doesn't take very long for people to see that you're living for a different purpose on this earth. It doesn't take very long for people to know that you're living for a different purpose. Especially whenever they know your old life, what you used to live for. I had some things that I lived for in my own life. And sometimes I still live for those things and I get slapped in the face a little bit. But God says, listen, Jesus lives inside of you. And, and Jesus wants to live outside of you. And the only way Jesus is going to live outside of you is you stop living your own life, your own purpose, and you start living your life for Jesus' purposes, for God's purposes. All right. So it goes back to what uh, John the Baptist says in John, John chapter 3. John the Baptist says, he must increase and I must decrease. And so it's less about us, less about what I want. Less about me and what I want, what my desires are, what my pleasures are, what my joys are. It's about what Jesus, it's about what Jesus wants. About what Jesus, what, what I can do to bring glory to him. What I can do to bring joy to him. What I can do to, to, to show others that Jesus does live inside of me. To get up every morning and say, Jesus, I'm going to live for you. Have you ever, have you ever, uh, you don't need to raise your hand, but I want you to think about this. Have you ever got up in the morning and say, Jesus, I want to live for you. I want to live my life for you. Yes, I know. I, I know it's still Travis living, but I don't want Travis to live. I want Jesus to live. I want Jesus to be seen not only inside of me, but I want Jesus to be seen outside of me. Today, Jesus, I want to live for you. I want to live for your purposes. Now, Paul says, and uh, the very last thing that Paul says, he says, I live this life in the flesh, uh, in faith. <clears throat> and so, Jesus has, has given us this new life, and this new life is all about Jesus. We come to church because it's all about Jesus. You go to work because it's all about Jesus. You go to school because it's all about Jesus. You, you're, you're going to a meal with your family. It's all about Jesus. Everything is about Jesus because your new life is all about Jesus. Because your new life is living for God's purpose. For Jesus' purposes. Now, what I what I did here is I broke down that word faith. Faith is that we have complete trust. Faith is that we have complete dependence. Faith is that we have complete confidence. And Paul tells us who we are to have complete trust, complete dependence, complete confidence in. It's not in me. It's not in my mother. Even though I do have faith and trust in her. It's not in my wife. It's not in Brittany or John or my grandkids or anybody. It is in Jesus. Complete confidence, complete trust, complete dependence in Jesus. Now, there is no faith in no one else. That faith only rests in God and God alone. In Jesus and Jesus alone. And so 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, We walk by faith and not by sight. So when we walk by faith and not by sight, first of all, the, the word sight means that we don't, we don't, we don't walk 
with things that we see. We don't walk with the things that we feel, with the things that we hear, or the things that we think, because Satan works in those areas. Satan blinds our eyes. Satan dulls our hearing. Satan makes us uh, insensitive or too sensitive to things that we, that we feel. And it certainly can also brainwash our thinking. We don't, we, that is not how we walk. That is not how we live for God's purposes. In the things that we see, the things that we feel, the things that we hear, the things that we think. But we live by faith, by the things that we know is true. We believe in those things that are true. We trust in those things that are true. And we hope in the things that are true to be revealed. And I ask the question, who is true? Well, in John chapter 14, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one can come to the Father except through him. And so Jesus is truth. And so we live our Jesus life in faith solely, solely in Jesus. I can't, <clears throat> I can't live, I can't live God's purposes. I can't, I, can't, I can't know God's purposes if I can't live with faith. I know what happens whenever my faith starts to fizzle or my faith starts to diminish. All of a sudden now, my purposes have changed in life. It's about, okay, this is going to happen, so now how do I get ahead of that? Or how do I stop that from happening? Or how do I, how do I intervene here so it doesn't happen or it doesn't happen too, too badly? When our faith is strong, when we completely trust, completely depend, and completely have confidence in Jesus, and it, it, nothing, nothing will sever living our purpose, living, living our lives for his purpose. And so Paul said, our sinful self died when Jesus died. We no longer live for our purposes. We live for Jesus' purpose. And we live for Jesus' purposes because we have a new Jesus life. Your old self died on that cross. And when Jesus, when you gave your life to Jesus, Jesus came in and gave you a Jesus life. Jesus' life lives inside of you. Now God wants that Jesus life to live outside of you. And how do you do that? You get up every morning and say, Jesus, today is Monday. And I want to live for you. Today is Tuesday. I want to live for you. Today is Wednesday. I want to live for you. I'd like to encourage all of you. If you're not already, I'd like to encourage all of you to get up every morning and pray that same prayer I've been praying. And say, Lord, <coughs> I want to live for you today. There is nothing of more greater value than living my rest of my days for you. There is nothing more important than living each day. And so, a life well lived is a life 